The Helicaster Jane Show airs Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern. The podcast's always available online at helicasterjane.com. Talk to me about the instrument. How important is the instrument to you? Is your instrument, get this, like your woman chosen because the two of you play well together? I mean, how important is that machine? In a way, any musician's instrument is an extension of the person. And if they don't find that, that can be very frustrating. Guitar players, cello players, violin players, everybody feels that. You finally find the, the horn or the guitar that speaks the way you want it to come out of you. And yes. Ah, a man and his instrument and the magic they can make together. I'm in awe. Hi, and welcome to the Hallie Casser Jane Show. I am Hallie Casser Jane. Thank you so much for tuning in. In this case, the man is Little River Band's Wayne Nelson, his machine, his bass guitar. I'll be speaking with Mr. Nelson about making music, his more than 30 years with one of the great bands of all time, and about the controversy that continues to surround the band as it has for 40 years, and so much more in a moment. But before we begin, today, the Hallie Kessler Jane Show is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Get a free audiobook and 30-day trial today by signing up at www.audibletrial.com forward slash The Hallie Kessler Jane Show. And remember, The Hallie Kessler Jane Show is always available online at HallieCasserJane.com and a host of venues including iHeartRadio, Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, TuneIn Radio, iTunes, and Blog Talk Radio. Lead singer and bass guitar player, songwriter and co-writer for Little River Band, Wayne Nelson has been playing bass and singing lead vocals with the band for more than 30 years. The Little River Band originally formed in Melbourne, Australia in 1975. Nelson came on board in 1979, the first American to join the band. All told, LRB has sold more than 30 million records and achieved 13 U.S. top 40 hits, most notably Reminiscent, Lonesome Loser, Cool Change, The Night Owls, and Take It Easy on Me, the latter two songs featuring lead vocals by Nelson and his considerable talent as a bass guitarist, his funk bass skills distinguishing him early in the band's history. Now, 40 years later, LRB continues to please its worldwide audience, though not without controversy. Infighting amongst the band's members, current and former, has long been part of its history. Still, the band plays on, as does Wayne Nelson, whose personal story begins shortly after his birth in Kansas City in 1950. It's interesting to note that Nelson did not start out with the aspiration to front a band. Let's talk. So, Wayne, born in Kansas City, raised in the Chicago area. You were a church-going kid. It was your dad who got you interested in music. That's true. Yes. Uh, dad and mom. Uh, mom played the classics and, uh, you know, some Broadway stuff, uh, you know, big big production show songs like uh, show tunes like Camelot and uh, My Fair Lady and things like that. Classic stuff. My dad was a drum major. So there was the melodic thing and the and the, the classical music and all of that stuff from one side and the the marching tempos and bass and low end coming from my dad. And then in, in, in church, I sang with all the men. I was singing the bass parts three octaves up when I was four and five years old. So I was I was literally immersed in it uh, from as far back as I can remember. That's great. I love that. Now, in most people would ask you about the guitar playing first, but I want to ask you about that voice. <laughs> did you know you had this voice early? I, I did, and you, I hated it. Oh. And I, look, I, I didn't. I wanted to be part of the crowd. I, I was a kid that did not want to be singled out, and um, it, it, it's silly, but you know, in 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 hindsight. All my all my friends were a year older. I was I had an IQ that was smart enough to be advanced. My parents wouldn't do it, and then came. Well, no, you can sing and you can do all these things and and so on. So I was constantly being singled out to go do things with choral contests, and I was a boy soprano. So I was I was appearing in operas as a boy soprano, and I hated it. 
I hated the whole routine of not being able to go to football practice, baseball practice, basketball practice, and be with the guys and be with my friends. I was always going to do this other stuff. Hmm. And uh, as soon as I could reject it, I did. So as soon as I was old enough to say, I'm done with the plays. I'm done with the, uh, I'm done with all of it. I'm going to be just, I'm just going to be me. And then you picked up the guitar though. Well, then I picked up the bass. And the reason was because you'll love this story. The, the, the drummer in the high school band that I joined, um, I was playing tambourine and singing background vocals just because I wanted to be in a rock and roll band. And I was telling the bass player, those aren't the right notes for the bass lines. I mean, we're doing current songs and and because of all of this background, I'm hearing the bass lines just as clear as a bell. And I'm telling him, that's not really, that's the wrong note. Drummer comes to me one day and says, if you can sing and if you can play bass, we can fire two people and we'll all make more money. (laughs) And And crux of it is two weeks later, I was singing lead and playing bass in, in the high school you know, in the high school rock and roll band. So I love that. I love that. But the, talk to me about this uh, guitar thing, because you didn't have any formal training in this. So so how did no. you master this thing? I mean, how did you create and then create your sound, which is very distinctive? Well, I really wanted to play. I, run, I wanted to play along with Rubber Soul. So mm-hmm. I borrowed a, an acoustic guitar and, you, you know, the age old story, just played until fingers bled and uh, learned chordal, uh, basic chord structures and, and some stuff. But I was always playing along with McCartney only I was playing on a guitar an octave up with a pick and then one day this this whole opportunity came and I put a bass on and I just went holy cow there it is that's what I'm that's where I feel the best and that th- and that's when that whole thing emerged I would take the bass and show the guy the parts and the drummer's looking at me and he went he just pulled me aside and after a couple times he said why don't you play bass why don't you sing and that's where it that's where it started at Nate Towns like yours what, born with something different in your blood? Obsession, addiction, part of what gets you there to master this thing that you master? Sure. What is it about you guys? I mean, who, who, you just can't put that instrument down. It's, it's, it's a body part. What, what, do you know, have you ever thought about it? Well, for a long time, when I finally got to the point where I did have the, the, the clear space to get obsessive <laughs> and get addictive, it was right at the point when Weather Report and Jaco Pistorius came along. And he revolutionized everybody's thoughts about what the bass could do, what it was about, that it was a showpiece instead of a, you know, instead of a background piece and whatever. And not that I've ever gotten anywhere near that level of playing, but that's when uh, I didn't put it down for five, six hours a day. Wow. And it did. It, it does. It gets in your blood and you you want to be that good when you put the instrument on. You want to be that good that you feel the power of what the instrument can do. And yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I'm an A, a type. I want to get it right. I want to have it sounding as good as I possibly can. And I I really wanted to be ready for whatever door opened in Chicago, in the music business. If you're not a blues player, you're doing all kinds of other things to to um, to stay alive. And I wanted to be ready for anything that was coming along. And and I loved R&B. I loved, you know, Earth, Wind and Fire and horn sections and so on and so forth. And I was playing with people from the band Rufus before Rufus went to Los Angeles and became internationally famous. I was in Rufus before Shaka Khan was Wow! Uh, in the offshoot of it, I should say, <laughs> not in the band itself. But those people were, I was again, immersed in a, in a style of music that I absolutely loved. And I did not set the bass down for probably two years if, un- unless it was to take a shower. Talk to me about the instrument. How important is the instrument to you? Is your instrument, get this, like your woman, chosen because the two of you play well together i mean how important is that machine in a way any musician's instrument is uh, an extension of the person and if they don't find that that can be very frustrating guitar players cello players violin players everybody feels that you finally find the the horn or the guitar that speaks the way you want it to come out of you um and yes interestingly enough uh my wife found both of my bases for me there was a company that wanted me to play their bases with little river band and i never ever was satisfied with with what they sent me, I was always dealing with the company uh, with, with Yamaha because Yamaha sponsored Little River Band. They gave us instruments, whatever. And um, she ordered a bass from from uh, you know a rep, and it arrived at the house. And I'd played a dozen of them and put them all back in the box and sent them back. I sat and played that one for for a couple of hours because it it rang before I ever it, it it sang to me before I ever plugged it in. And yes, any any serious musician has to create that bond with that instrument because it is the it's the expression of their it's what they want to say in their in their soul or their heart and the instrument's got to 
got to be able to put it out there. And you're playing with what today? I'm playing a Fender five string. Interesting model design. Um, it is a um, Victor Bailey model, which had a moment in the sun and then it kind of faded away to other less expensive, I guess, or less. He- th- this this bass is very heavy. I, I My chiropractor loves the fact that I play this bass. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but that's the one that I took it out of the box and, and she had bought it for me as a birthday present and surprised me completely. I opened it up and fell in love with it. But that's, that's, that's the main instrument now. That's the main one. Go back with me a little bit to the music that you listened to as a kid. And if you were to, I said five songs, five, 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 who would that be? Who most influenced? Wow. Five songs. I'll go back as far as I can. Okay. First of all, the Beatles. And I'll just put the Beatles in one big category because okay. I couldn't single out one song. Instantly, I want to hold your hand. I, I wanted to, to know how to play that song. Uh, and then everything that came after them. So they, they've got their own place on the shelf. The Four Seasons, <laughs> Dawn Go Away, to listen to those guys sing was was a, a life changer. The Beach Boys, I think it was something called Summer summer something or other. It was, uh, you know, very commercial, but very, very emotional, passionate, not it wasn't about cars. It was about the beach and girls. And I grew up in the Chicago area, central Illinois. So, you know, I saw cornfields and snow. That's why the <laughs> Beach Boys were so huge. And I don't know if I can fit nine more bands in the top five, but Chicago mm-hmm. opened my eyes to horns, vocals, great rock and roll players, all of the above. And then the last one I would have to say would be number five would be Motown and number five A would be Earth, Wind and Fire because they took it all and just took it to, to 11. Those would be... I guess if I had to be stranded somewhere, I'd take those five. Those would be the five that you would take with you. I, it's phenomenal to me. You came out of Chicago at a hell of a time, right? I mean, yes. look what else came out of Chi-Town. I mean, Buckingham, Chicago Transit, or Authority also, as we all, you and I both know as Chicago, Stick, Survivor, REO Speed, a Cheap Trick, and, of course, mm-hmm. Earth, Wind, and Fire. I mean, that's extraordinary. I mean, what is it in the water? <laughs> Does it come out of the lake that well, makes you there, guys so there talented? Were, there were more. There were bands like The Flock and The Cry and Shame. Right. Uh, uh, the flock was like you know this experimental crazed um, power trio. Um, uh, Cry and Shames were literally were doing Beatles songs that the Beatles weren't doing. They were they were slipping songs to these guys in Chicago. It was an amazing time. The American Breed, Rufus, and and Wayne Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, that there was there was there was no one that knew knew anything about that. The break I got with Little River Band was again being able to do what you do when the, when the door opens and you can you can fit, you can make you do the right thing for the right band. And I was in the right place at the right time. But at the time in Chicago, Chicago to me was um, was college. It was it was graduate school for learning all those different styles and how to how to find the essence of all of them and relate to all of them because I they, all of us were walking in the same circles we you know peter Eck lived on the north side so survivor got put together on the north side i lived on the south side but we were all colliding as we as we went around it was an amazing time and like i say i was there playing music from 65 to 78 is when i moved to la and in those 10 12 years it was graduate school um got to go on the road got to play folk music with a girl named megan mcdonough all the way to playing r&b with people that had been in rufus so it was it was just a great time first band like First Woman, ever forget that first band and the first performance? No, it was pretty low key. Uh, we, <laughs> we we stole the uh, we stole the key, the organ player's parents Hammond from their living room and put it on a pickup truck and drove across town to friends who were throwing a backyard party. We only knew three songs and we played them about seven times. <laughs> I'll never forget it. To this day, the the drummer in that band and I are extremely close, very good friends, and uh, he went in a whole different route. He went to a doctorate in in education, and I relate to where he's, the the field that he's in and what he's doing for the planet, and he's relating to the music part of what we're doing for the planet, and the two of us are living vicariously both sides of what what we didn't do, if you know what I mean. Right. You were supposed to go a different route. You went to college. Your parents wanted you to be a doctor, a lawyer, right? Blah, 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 blah. Well, accountant, yeah. And then I got into <laughs> audiology, which I'm still fascinated by. I would be an audiologist today if if I were to choose a, another career. Really? Because the study of your ears and what they do for us and how they work is is just one part of the body that's just amazing. You're but just I a was, sound uh, machine. That's you. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> and they, they were, and I was the clinic guinea pig. I would do gigs and come back and my ears would be ringing and they'd be checking my ears and, and all this stuff. But I eventually succumbed to music. Succumbed, huh? Some, su- some succumbing. Listen to me. First of all, you got married somewhere along the line. I couldn't find out when. When did you get married? Um, first was in you know, 76 to the woman that uh, we had two kids together. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, we divorced in 96, married again in 99 to uh, my current wife. Okay, because I could get nothing out of there. And well, that'll come up again in a little bit. But I wanted to get that on the record. And a lot of women think you're kind of sexy and cute. And they wanted to know they'll want to know if you're married or not. No, no comment from you? <laughs> None whatsoever, because I, I, my comment was they better check their their prescription on their glasses. No, 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 how'd you let that one go? I would never let that one go, but I'm glad you didn't let that go completely. You were listening to the Helly Kesser Jane Show and my conversation with Little River Band's bass player, singer, and songwriter, Wayne Nelson. The Helly Kesser Jane Show is always available online at hellycasserjane.com. You chased the dream. You went to L.A. And you were an only kid, pretty independent for an only kid. What? What? What was the dream? What was the dream? Tell me that. The dream was music. The dream was, I didn't know where it was going to go, but the dream was to get out there and be part of it. And again, as incredible as the time was in Chicago, the mid 70s, as disco took over and then a, 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 a whole nother wave of stuff happened, Chicago changed. And it was always a hard town to work in, especially I, I got a, a mild case of frostbite when I was a kid. So working in Chicago, you load in and load out and it's sub zero. You know, you go into the into the men's room and you just stand there with your hands in hot water. As half the crowd is coming in and out and going, hey, aren't you in the band? What are you doing in here? All that weird stuff. That's what I had to do because my hands were were numb. Mm. And so to get to L.A. and to get off the plane in L.A., before there were jetways, there was the stairs walking down the, from the plane. I put my feet on the on the tarmac and I went, that's it. I'm I'm done with Chicago. I am done with cold. And the music scene in L.A. was just exploding on all fronts. A friend asked me to go out there, said, I wouldn't ask you to come just to just to be unemployed and pay your dues. There's an opening in a band that I'm playing in. And uh, so I went for it. I just said, I got it. I got to try. And if it doesn't work, I'll go back. But but I have to try. And then when I got there, there was just no there was no question I was going to stay and make something happen. I didn't know what, but it makes something happen. And something did happen somewhere along the line. You meet Loggins and Messina. They were already split, though, weren't they? When uh, you met one, then you met the other, and is that how that story goes? <laughs> yeah, uh, again, flying by the seat of my pants. I had a friend who did everything by the book. He went to the musicians union, and he enrolled in the musicians union, and he went every day to look at um, uh, the bulletin board because all kinds of people would put stuff on the bulletin board at the union to try to find musicians. Little did I know that wasn't really the place to go to find the dream. That was the place to go f- if you wanted to be in one of those structured nine to five musical situations of which there are many in the in out there still going on but this buddy called said jim messina is looking for a bass player well i love loggins and messina they were one of my favorite bands all the different textures all the different things they did and uh, again horn section too so i answered it and he had gone through 60 plus players from la and and the region and i still can't i can't tell you i can tell you definitively it was not just bass playing that got me the job because there are incredible bass players went up to audition with him it was either an attitude thing or whatever we didn't even sing together we just played he liked the way i played and we we hit it off i think there was he was he was looking as much for a social match with his band as he was for for players that that like that he liked what they did and because so, of that you ahead. wind up with uh, playing what you opened for L- little river band and yes that, uh, um the only touring we did we, we did jimmy's first solo record the only touring we did was a two-week opening slot for little river band they were recording their live cd double album called backstage pass and they wanted a very strict routine for those two weeks um they wanted a band they could count on boom sound checks over everybody's doing things right on the clock so that they can get out there and record every night and then you know choose the best nights and make their their live cd so again perfect place perfect timing for us to be with them for two weeks they came out to watch jim messina their bass player had quit they stood side stage and they watched this American bass player who was singing and playing very kind of complex Latin rhythms that Jimmy was into. And um, uh, little did I know, they were basically auditioning me as as uh, as the two weeks went by. And what do we say? The rest is history. <laughs> 
Right. The rest almost wasn't history because the band, the Messina band, was also a band on its own. We were writing and recording our own music, and Jim was going to re, uh, produce us. And you know, there was there was a there was a, a deeper plan than just doing his record. And so Little River Band said, "Do you want to come to Australia and uh, and uh, rehearse and tour, and we'll see, maybe record, and we'll see if you become a band member, or whatever?" And I said, "No, I'm really not." interested in doing that because we're we're you know we're doing our own thing and a month later it all fell apart and i made the call to australia because i saved the numbers i made the call to australia and i said this everything fell apart here and and i just wonder if the job is still available and they said yeah we'll call you in april this was in december we'll call you in april and i went okay that one's over and we'll 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 start looking for what's next and sure enough april they called and said world tour come down here in april we'll rec- rehearse for two weeks and then we go right, were you I- freaked <laughs> <laughs> totally freaked. I'm I'm writing this stuff as fast as I can, uh, you know, uh, on the on the wall phone, the old princess wall phone, oh, I'm just, like with the curly cord. I'm you know, no cell phones or anything stuffed in it, and um, thought I, this is too good to be true. And and sure enough, in the mail comes the itinerary and all of this stuff, and it was uh, it was real airfare and the whole bit. There you go. So listen to me. What what could one say about that band? Except to say, oh, my God. I mean, why, right? Probably beautiful. River Band? Yes. I mean, beautiful songs. Unbelievable hits. It, wh- 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 my God. You know, everybody should fall into that one, right? So many and, greats. And, and, and. And? Not great songs and, and hits and whatever, but ultimate, the ultimate vocal band. Well, yeah. We're going to get to that. I, I, to, to, and when I first got there, it was really interesting because, of course, the band was, was intact. Um, but I found out pretty quick that singing little river band songs on you know on a tour and in a regular succession is a very physical job and um the the middle harmony is the most physical of all and uh starts to chew voices up it was chewing up the guy that was in the band at the time and i kind of slowly but surely started singing some of those parts by the time i was 45 mid 40s to late 40s it chewed me up and um we had to hire somebody else that could do that. And it worked out because I started singing lead vocals full time. And then there was just no way I could be that guy to be singing in the middle. It chewed his voice up. And now we've got a fourth person singing that part. It's, um, you know, it's full on. I, I, I used to call it, it's really actually shouting in tune. It's more, you, you're singing your guts out, singing the middle part of, of Little River Band harmonies. Um, but it didn't happen right away. I was playing bass and, and was barely singing at all. And then one one song at a time, we kind of got a, a, a melding of the voices. And to step to the microphone and sing with those guys every night, um, the music w- was great. But to, but to consistently sing with those people uh, powerfully uh, in front of big audiences was mind-blowing. Just mind blowing. Can't even imagine. I have to say, you were the first American to play with that band, correct? Yes. Right. Yep. I mean, that was pretty big because that's an Australian band for anybody who's listening in on this for the and you know, doesn't know the whole history. So that was a big step for them as well as for you, and that was very helpful to them in helping them get some hits here in America, of which one of your songs that you were lead singer and lead guitar on made it. Night Owl. Yes. Yes. And the the, the irony to that is once. Okay, all of this was the all of the stuff we just talked about was the um, the heady stuff, the um, the wow stuff, and we, we went to Europe and we played for 120,000 people on my 30th birthday. It was the first job, first first show with the band with Fleetwood Mac and uh, Bob Marley and and other uh, other European artists. It was just it, it was all wow. It was just continuous wow for about two years. Um, but in the midst of that. What I found out was that I had been dropped into a situation that was rife with um, rivalry and political, um, I'll just say it, politi- there, there, there was backstabbing going on, there was maneuvering going on, there was manipulation going on uh, outside of where other people knew. And slowly but surely, I found out that I, I was in the middle of a cauldron of, of uh, it, it was a mess, the band was a mess, with four different people pulling at the pulling at the reins, trying to take it different directions. And it was out of control for management. It was out of control for the record label. And uh, uh, that was that was the, the downside of that whole thing. The reason I sang Night Owls is because of that political upheaval, because the songwriter for Night Owls didn't like the way the lead singer was interpreting the songs. And I found out that there was an agenda. I was kind of handed the song at a rehearsal when the lead singer wasn't there and it just evolved exactly the way the guy wanted to to where we got to the studio and 
I was singing Night Owls. So the wow continued for another six or seven months because Night Owls climbed to number five. It was the first time I'd ever sung lead on a song in the studio ever. So this, it, it, the, the momentum was just a, a crazy time in, uh, in, in a musician's life. I can just imagine that. And, and we're going to go back to that, but I want to go on to, to, to the fact that you were doing this. I mean, the album, Time Exposure, oh my God, right? The Love beat, it. <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too. But that was a trip for you as well. I mean, you worked with um, George Martin, the Beatles producer, right? Mm-hmm. And, yep. Je- and Jeff Emmerich, one of the best engineers ever. He did the, uh, who did the legendary Beatles adam- albums. He was working on that with you guys. And that was the one, and there you are, showcased, right? Yeah. And, and, and tell us the- about that. Well, the other, there was another moment too. It, yes, it was amazing. The, the, one of the fun things was, you know, the, the very first meeting, George said, okay, no Beatles questions until dinner <laughs> because otherwise we'd have sat around and talked about Beatles trivia all day long. So we were like little school kids. We would wait for the bell to ring and we would run in and sit down at this long dining table and then we would just start firing questions at him and, uh, dessert and coffee, boom, back to work. No more Beatles questions. Um, but as, as, as gratifying as Night Owls was, there was a there was a better there was a different moment for me that was amazing. And um, I told George this, and we've we've talked about it since. The second song that was the single off of that record was a song called "Take It Easy on Me," and I loved it. I absolutely and still do to this day. It is the bellwether of every night for me because it's emotional and it covers the widest range, and it's the hardest thing to to harness. But yet, it's still the biggest challenge, and I love it, and I love. The, the song we were counting to four playing the song and stopping it was basically an album track and nobody was really paying attention to it and in the middle of that i said i think this strong this song is stronger or could be stronger if we had a different arrangement for it what if it started with piano and vocal and then built at the first chorus and then bang the band is in for the second chorus and it builds some more and then and then we're out and everybody kind of well all right we'll give it a shot the piano player was a great player session player but he was there with us he played it once we did it once that way and to hear george martin come on the talk back and say fantastic that's the way we're doing it the very next cut the very next time we played it is the cut that went to time exposure and and the the greatest hit cd and so on and so forth and it became a hit and to me that moment of actually contributing (laughs) a musical arrangement uh to, to the band was that was your moment well, it was it it was very important. Look, the lead vocal. We didn't know Night Owls was going to be a hit. We didn't know what was going to get chosen. At that moment, I knew I had made a contribution to the band, and that was that was the a major one. And then, boom, those two songs become the first two singles. So that's hindsight. But that moment with George Martin validating that yes, this song could be stronger, and and that's the way it went. And uh, that basically is my cornerstone for 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 continuing on and for for the validity of look i i contributed to hit songs for little river band too it's you know i might not have been there for 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 some of them but i was certainly there for for important ones too Uh, there there is no question about that at all and 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 let's go into what i call the controversy that's what i call it because i think it's ridiculous and i'm gonna say it on air i'm on your side on this i don't get what's been going on with this glenn shorrock he was an original member of LRB, um, wrote a letter in January. You guys were supposed to do, for, as a celebration of the 40th anniversary, and to uh, hawk your, your newest album, Cuts Like a Diamond, Jimmy Fallon. Mm-hmm. And you're all set to go, and Shurik writes, I think, one of the most obnoxious letters <laughs> of all time. <laughs> to Certainly is an obnoxious headline, and... Um... Uh, but I'll go, go ahead. I don't know whether you want to say a four letter word. Or well, not, here's but, what uh, I'm going to let, let me go with it. I'm going to say in the letter he wrote about, quote unquote, his distress and outrage, saying the current band is, quote unquote, grinding our good name into the dust. And further, he went on to say that if you decided to put him on the show, just pass on my message to go F yourselves themselves. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's how we'll play with that one. Yes. And I'm disappointed that Fallon acquiesced. And I'm not quite sure I get why he acquiesced. I mean, what is it with this guy? And what's the mentality that caused, I mean, is he behind it? I mean, the problems that have been with the band, what, what's the point? And I'm going to take it on the level, level, but let me, let me ask you that. What's the, what was his point? Why, why do it? His, his point was driven by uh, his, well, his outrage. You, you, You said it right. He, he said it. That's the way he said it, that we would dare. And by the way, I never said this. But, but that we would dare go on TV and claim our 40th anniversary. Everything was – all the press, it was Little River Band's 40th anniversary. And there has – those guys who were 
the authors or the uh, instigators of all of that turmoil and whatever, um, they they didn't get along. They either fired each other or, like I say, manipulated each other or backstabbed or quit because they were tired of being Little River Band. Glenn was tired of being Little River Band. He even said in a thing in one of those articles about it, it was it was the ghost of Little River Band coming back to haunt me again. If that's the way you feel about it, I can't say any more than you can what the point is. The point seems to be if we can't go over and do this, then we're not going to allow the people that carried on to do it either. And look, there are two sides to the coin, and there are purists who feel that a band shouldn't continue on if the band members aren't there. We oh, wait, to, let me, we, let, we, right, but let me get in here with you because there are a couple of things here, that, and I want to respond to what you're saying, and that mm-hmm. is, first of all, bands do evolve and art evolves, and if, and if art doesn't evolve, then it isn't art. It stops. So there's that to look at, number one. You were not there in the very beginning, but your case is really rather unique because when you got there, you changed things, and you were there to change things. So if he says that what you're doing now isn't part of LRB, I'm not quite sure I understand. You were good enough for him to hire, to take you in, and to get him a couple of hit songs he wouldn't have had without you. Therein lies some dilemma for me. And I'm sure for a lot of the fans of LRB, what say you? Well, I'm, I'm, I would like uh, this is a this is a, a a strange exercise, but I I do it all the time because I truly believe this. They didn't have a bass player, and what I was telling you about vocals sooner or later, the politics, the vocals, the physical part of it, the traveling back and forth. The band was at a point it could have it could have gone away. I'm going to take myself out of it. There was one guy in the band that didn't want an American in the band. He wanted to keep it pure. He wanted an Australian band, Australian players. He was one of the four directions that were were, were pulling on the band as a writer and, and performer and so on and so forth. He had his very, very rigid ideas. Um, he left, but the, the point I'm getting to is it wasn't all roses and, and, and uh, you know, uh, good good vibes about what happened. But the point is somebody had to come and be in the band. Take my name out of it. Take me out of it. Take it. Don't make it be me. Make it be somebody else. That person walks in the room, drops into the middle of the political thing, and one of the major songwriters says, hey, I want you to sing this song. Give give this song a try. The lead singer doesn't even care enough to be at rehearsals. People are sniping at each other. People are talking behind each other's backs. People are saying to me, we need to go this way. And then somebody else says to me, we need to go this way. It was a mess. I'll just tell you right now, it was a mess. And I'm sitting there at the first major meeting, um, and everybody around me says, you know what, we just can't work with the lead singer anymore. I'm like, what are you talking about? We just had four years in a row of top ten hits. We just had five with Night Owls, and little did we know, we're on our sixth year in a row of having a top ten hit, and you want to fire the lead singer? Well, you guys are crazy. Everybody voted to do it. Management went along with it, and I was the guy that said no. Again, forget my name. Forget me, somebody else would have either been in that position or Little River Band could have dissolved and gone away, puff of smoke, in 1981, early 82. That's when everything just started to erupt. And lots of people hate me because they say it's my fault. And what I'm trying to get across to them is... You saved the day, not the, founding, the other way around. Well, the founding members did this. I, I, the fact that there was somebody else there saved the day. I, I hate saying it was me because it very well easily well, could have been somebody it. else. I'm saying it, okay? I'm taking the onus off of you. I'm saying it, and, and, and you know that I've been around the industry for a long time. I work with The Doors on a number of projects, uh, including with Densmore on, on uh, his, his uh, autobiography. You know, it was in and behind. I understand what goes on behind the scene that, unfortunately, not a lot of people do know what goes on behind the scenes of a lot of bands. And there's, there's, there's sibling rivalry. There's, there's, you know, there's ego. There's all of that stuff. And it's really rather unfortunate. You know, artists do tend to be, you know, sensitive types. That's fine. Uh, that's what makes great art. But, mm-hmm. but to, to call you guys at this point a cover band or a tribute band, I find ridiculous. And I also think that it, it says more about those guys who are sitting and not playing anymore and not in a good way than it does about the people who are doing what I think is really important, which is bringing forward 
forward, not stopping, not starting something new, bringing forward a band who I think has had an enormous uh, effect uh, on the music industry over the years. So I think, I've, did we settle it? That, <laughs> I mean, that's, I had to go there with you because I, I'm just so appalled by, by, uh, the nonsense that's been going on around this. So, well, there, 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 you know, it's, it's a, it's a continuum. There are people on, on, on the end of the scale that, that feel and see through this. And, 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 and part of it is knowing the people. But more importantly, what you just said is very true. Knowing what goes on behind the scenes with bands and management and so on and so forth, there is, there's a world of pettiness that nobody knows or sees because they get the final result and they get the joy of we love that song and so on. But you're absolutely right. Back to your point of what's the point of them doing this? The only point is to obstruct. Those guys tried to get back together and they don't want to perform together. They don't want to do this. They just don't want us to do it. Right. It's really very strange. And by you know, by obstructing us, they're even obstructing their own income and the income streams for a lot of other people who are associated with older Little River Band products. Um, and well, they, it's, it's petty it's, crap is what it is. And and they don't even own the name, right? Because they sold no. that out to take cash to, 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 uh, to cash out of the band. I mean, there's a lot of ugliness that's, that's behind this story that, um, especially no, but, Mr. Shorrock. Mr. Shorrock right. was paid very well when he left. Right. This is almost 20 years ago now, by the way, 20 years, right. right. Half the band's life has been without these people. And, uh, th- th- how it was stopped was by a technicality called sync rights, which means if you're going to, if you're going to put music together with video, that's going to be repeated. It, the, the song publisher, um, has to allow you to do that. It's another layer of music involved with TV and video and internet and so on and so forth. Right. They were and, also he was also successful in stopping you from one of the venues that you were performing in, but but um, the the venue was ticked off about it as well, saying this is really a low blow, blah 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 blah. So you know, I th- I think we've made that made the point. You think we made yeah. the point? I think we made the point, and I'm glad that well, we were able to do that on the show today. I got to move to something very sad. What a life, right? You have had one heck of a lot. We all should have your life on a lot of levels, storied life. But but how many of us really get to uh, realize our dreams as you have on such a large stage? But that storied life, uh, whenever there's one, it comes in, in, in many ups and downs. There, everything is not wonderfully up uh, that isn't equally horribly down. That's been uh, my experience in viewing great success. Or as the late Jim Morrison used to say, no one here gets that alive. You had a 13-year-old daughter who was killed in a car accident. Give me a break at the height of things for you. And I think you were and your wife were in Europe at the time that the accident occurred and your son was involved. I, I, can't, I can't even imagine. Do you hear me? I can't even imagine enduring something like that. Talk to me. It is, um, it's not easy to talk about it. Um, it's uh, it it it's a place that won't and can't ever go away. You, uh, I, everybody has to deal with it their own way. I, I, I have to lock it up. Um, it's there, and it's a, you know, it's it's a it's a hole. It's a vacuum. Uh, she was a writer. I discovered stuff that she wrote when she was eleven. And um, because it was our first computer and I had to do maintenance on the computer and I saw this document sitting on the desktop and uh, I knew she was in a writing class and I just peeked at it. And uh, uh, she she wrote this description of I just want to tell, tell the world who the person was. She wrote a description of a forest fire, only she wrote it from the perspective of the animals. Mm. And I was reading this and just uh, just immediately drawn into feeling the panic of forest animals as they were being surrounded by this flash fire. Next day I said to her, great stuff that you're going to hand in. That was amazing. Where, you know, where did you find that? She said, what do you mean? I said, well, that's so powerful. Where, where, you know, is that from a book or something? She said, no, daddy, I wrote that. (laughs) So yeah, I know what, I know what the world lost. I know what I lost. Um, We lost our family. But uh, it, uh, there, there are no words to describe that. And now I can smile when I see pictures and, and know that, that, you know, those 13 years, almost 14 years were 
they were meant to be. That's the way it is. And you have to look at the positive because if you stay and keep looking at the tragedy of of her being killed in a car accident, you you don't surface. You don't come out. You don't come back from it. You wrote the most gorgeous song about that called Who Made the Moon. Can you tell us a little bit about that? The lyrics, amazing. Uh, I can. The, the, first of all, I'm not a prolific writer. I admire people who can do that craft and do it, go deep and find stuff over and over again. I've got tons of starts and stops and, and, and not a whole lot to show for it. But there was a concert I was going to do with a friend. He had original music, and I said, I want to contribute something. And I sat down, and I'm also not a great guitar player. I love playing bass, but I'm a hack at actual guitar. And I played the notes that opened the thing up, and I said, I like that, and I started writing. And 45 minutes later, I was done with Who Made the Moon. In a pile of tears, uh, I, I, I don't know where the answer is, and I don't know what the answer to the mystery is, but I know I had help. And those words were, those questions were questions that both Aubrey and Brad asked me when they were little. <laughs> and we puff up and we're their parents and we're supposed to know answers. So we give them the best answers we can. But in the end, um, the, 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 the circle comes back around to what do we really know? We're here. We, we have to make the best of it. And that's what, that's what who made the moon was was essentially about, and as an adult, to have, sorry. That's all right. I hear you. I hear the, you. The ultimate question. Can't answer it. There's no reason why she's gone. That song, did that song bring you back to life? No. Um, that song got that out. It's the beauty of songs and music. It you, it's a bundle that comes out, and it's a you, you breathe a little easier. But no, my son is what hmm. saved my life, and we had to save each other's lives. Um, it was, you know, it's it's a horrible time. It it tears at everything you are, and uh, he was a junior in college, and he's. Every bit as creative and as you know, full of life, and and uh, he's a he, he's a hockey player, um, has had great buddies and so on and so forth. And I know the feeling going all the way back to where what we were talking about. I didn't want to be different. I wanted to fit in. He walked back to school. He was out of school for a month to try and and recover because he was in the accident too. Right. He was hurt, and he ended up a hundred yards down the road and couldn't go back. He never saw his sister again. Uh, but he had to go back to school and he went back to school and everybody was sympathetic and the outpouring of love and, and thing from, from everybody was amazing. But when he walked back into school, everybody stopped and looked at him. He's the guy that survived and it took him a long time to, to overcome that. We've got it. You know, we're, we're, he's got two boys now. Wow. Uh, he's just an amazing dad, an amazing young man, but getting him through and not letting him be crushed by that accident was that was my life for over two years to get him back to college, get him back on track and let him go. And now he's got a great career and he is a pioneer in his own field and, and he's doing his thing. But that was in jeopardy what does for, he do? for a long time. Sorry. What does he do? He designs cars wow. for the future for Chrysler Motors. Um, and he does it on, he, he's a computer graphics person. He was in the gaming industry for a long time. And the reason he has his own niche in Chrysler at his design studio is that he can take the cars that the guys design and he can put them on any highway anywhere in the world and make a video for the, the brass to see. Whereas before, it was, you know, the car would just sit there and spin on the computer screen. Brad can take it and put it in, uh, Le Mans if he wants to. He can put it in the streets of San Diego if he wants to. And he's still blowing people away by what he does. He learned it all. He learned all of the code, all the programming and the whole industry as an apprentice knocking on the door to say, I want to do this. How do I do it? He carved his own, he carved his own path and he is amazing. A uh, chip uh, off the old block. It sounds like it to me, Mr. Wayne. I'm telling you, he sounds like he's definitely your kid. Listen to me. You left the band for a couple of years to get yourself through all of this. They yeah. asked you back. You went back. Yes. I went back because the, I left because we had stopped doing new music. Those people 
that we were talking about earlier. As it got further and further and further along, we got down to the same 11 songs every night, every day, every day, the same way. No rehearsals, show up, play and leave. And I said, this is not, this isn't musical. This isn't fun. There's no real reward here. And I left and things changed. M- more lineup changes happened and there were new people who had new songs and wanted to do new music. They asked me to come back, be the bass player and sing and produce the next record. And since then, since 2000, we've made four original CDs and three live CDs. And um, we're in the midst of a project right now. I'm in the studio right now talking to you. We're working on the next one. The Little River Band is alive and came alive because if a band doesn't do new music, a band is dead. You're dead in the water. Don't care how long it takes for you to realize it, you're done. And that was a shame. And then when, when it changed, I came back. And I think your point is well taken. You were listening to the Helly Kesser Jane Show and my conversation with Little River Band's bass player, singer, and songwriter, Wayne Nelson. The Helly Kesser Jane Show is always available online at hellycasserjane.com. This is a tough question. After you go through something like losing... Tougher than the other ones? Well, I think so, in a way, because after you lose your daughter in something so horrendous like that, one minute she's there, the next minute she's gone, as an artist, because I think that art really comes from the soul, and an event like that alters the soul, I think you'd agree. How did that change your music and your music making? Uh, well, I can, I can, I'll speak to the last big project we did cuts like a diamond cuts like a diamond not only did the label say we want you to sing the songs we don't want multiple lead vocals or what we want you to sing the songs we want you to produce it and uh what it did was when we started thinking about the songs i stopped thinking about the hits and the um the politics and the egos and the so on and so forth that they're still with us. I mean, we have we have things way better under control than than what I described from earlier years. But I said to the record label, I'm going to bypass all of that right now. And I'm going to say to you, I will choose the songs that I feel passionate that I could sing and would be proud to sing. And then I'm going to let you tell me what ones you like, because your your involvement will be important because you're the ones that have to put the cd out there i don't want to deliver you something that i want to do because it has to align with what you want to hear too and i don't i've always been a collaborator and had that kind of spirit but at that point i isolated myself with the headphones from the rest of the guys to to look for the material that i could relate to and put across and the change is down in there somewhere it's inherent in there because I related to songs that you could feel that somebody had gone through something that motivated them to tell their story, as opposed to that it was just churned out by rhyming some words and, 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 you know, and, and making stuff up. That's to me was the, that was the beacon for me. If it rang my bell, I would present it to the record label and let them say, okay, run with that one. I like the way that sounds. I have to, Lighten it up for a minute. You crack me up. <laughs> I mean, there are some things that I read about you that were amusing. One of them is, and I don't even believe you, said so the, the, the Little River Band is not your favorite band. Give me a break. <laughs> I think that's so cute. Who is? Earth, Wind, and Fire. Oh, uh, my and, baby. And, you and I are like born in the same mold. <laughs> I love them. Yes. Next to well, you. The, and and they, they, like I say, they epitomize R&B, vocals, horns, songs, spirit. Um, and I, and I truly mean spirit of, you know, the, the essence of their music is, uh, uh, it, it's spiritual and, and they still put that across to this day. They're, they're having fun and they're doing what they're doing, but they're doing it because this inner spirit that just, it just resonates with me. Um, if I could, I don't know how to encapsulate this in, in a short time, but, to take the heritage of Little River Band and the history of Little River Band and the spirituality of what the songs mean to people and to start giving back, that's what's been going on for the last few years. We're finding avenues where we can do fundraisers and donate our time, donate our music and, and, and whatever to draw people in to make them aware of situations and circumstances for the military, for cancer survivors, for 
uh, homeless for um, dog rescues and pet, you know, animal rights and so on and so forth. Those things are all so rewarding. And the spirit of where Earth, Wind and Fire comes from to me is it's printed inside me somewhere. It's part of what I feel when we take the stage. We're having a ball and we're having a ball expressing ourselves every night w- with with this music and like i say the 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 ability to give back and to help people get their charities and their nonprofits and stuff organized and up and running and stuff like that is just extremely rewarding to to us all of us right and i should say that on 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 this newest album one of the songs which one is it it's uh lost and Lo- the lost and the lonely it's dedicated to the green berets and and in honor of our fallen soldiers and all I guess proceeds from that go to charity. All the proceeds for the whole year are going to it's it's now the the, the guy that started the Green Beret Foundation has moved on to something called Mission America. And in 25 words or less when people transition out of the military, a lot of times they are given 30 days notice to get their entire life together. Insurance, housing, education, um uh, occupation, uh, everything, everything in 30 days. You'd imagine uprooting somebody with two kids and whatever from their their place, and suddenly they have to go and do that. It's an amazing thing. Mission America is helping give them resources to go do that. That's just one of the things that they do. But um, little known fact, we send those people over there to put their lives on the line so we can do what we do in our free country. And then when they come back, we basically just kick them to the curb a lot of times. We kick them to the curb, and that's disgusting and has to change. And until it does, we're going to try to help bridge the gap. But every download all year long for the lost and the lonely, at the end of the year, we will write a check. Every bit of what Little River Band would have made from that from that song will go to Mission America. I love it. I love it. The music industry, real quick, today. Hmm. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts? In, a, in, in, in Just quickly. Massive change, obviously. Um, uh, massive change to the uh to to the vehicle um you still gotta you still gotta write a song you still gotta deliver a song that that engages people and draws them in now it's um you know streaming and and downloading and so on and so forth that can you take one you don't take a cd so on and so forth it's it's a it's a very different world of course to to what to to the music industry we grew up in i still think there's incredible talent there's still incredible songwriting there's great talent out there it's how it gets into people's ears that is massively different. And I will say that there are still people out there that are ripping musicians off right and left, making a fortune, hit and run uh, with with their websites and their services and their so on and so forth. Um, so in one sense, it's massively different. And in the other sense, there's still a bunch of greed, you know, wound into the process. And uh, you got to watch everything you do. Uh, but I still think the, the essentials are the same. You got to deliver a song that engages people, and then you got to find a way to get a lot of people to hear it. That's it, and it's tough these days. Your favorite band, one of your favorite bands, the Beatles, so influenced you. Here's a lyric: Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? Hey, buddy, you're 64 years old, and yeah, you're touring. Well, it, it suddenly became my ringtone, my <laughs> ringback tone about three months ago. People are saying, uh, you got a birthday coming up or what? That's, 100 shows a year you're still doing, though, right? I remember cutting school. I lived three blocks from the high school. I cut school and ran at lunchtime because uh, Sergeant Peppers was out, and I had one. And we went home and we put it on and, and two of my musician friends and I, we just sat glued to the to the hi-fi, played it about 10 times. And here it is. I'm there. I'm 64. It's crazy. but um, And looking uh, damn good, I might say. Ever too old to play rock and roll music? Uh, from the neck up? No, I'm still 29 <laughs> from the neck up. I, here's to play. Here's the difference. I, I, I said I would stop when my voice would not deliver Little River Band songs to the quality that that I wanted them to have. So far, knock on wood, that hasn't happened. But um, I've seen other bands do it, and I don't see any reason why I couldn't play bass for Little River Band and be one of the one of the singers for the band uh, for a whole lot more years. So uh, it, it ain't over yet. Well, that's our good our good uh, luck. Your voice, I think, only gets better, by the way. I don't think it gets I, – I just think it gets richer. You are very kind. Thank you. Honest. Never cut, just honest. We talked about your song, Who Made the Moon. I'm, I want to read a lyric from that. It says, who paints the sky, who hangs the stars and turns them on 
each night. How can I fill this empty room? Why'd she have to leave so soon? God, who made the moon. Hey, Wayne, think you'll ever be able to fill the empty room? Nope. Uh, that's her room. And that will that room will always be empty for me. Uh, there are a lot other rooms that are full to overflowing. And uh, the balance is is a life. But no, her her room, her room is is will always be empty at 13 years, 11 months. I've been speaking with Wayne Nelson, bass player and lead vocalist for Little River Band. For more information on the band and tour dates, visit littleriverband.com. And be sure to visit their vital Facebook page, listed under, what else? Little River Band. Before I go, I want to remind everyone that podcasts of current and past shows are always available to listen to free on iTunes under The Hallie Caster Jane Show. The Hallie Caster Jane Show was also available for download via Spreaker.com, Stitcher.com, BlogTalkRadio.com, and a host of other venues. Google The Hallie Caster Jane Show, and you will find us. Of course, podcasts of our shows, both past and present, are always posted for your listening pleasure at HallieCasterJane.com which I hope you'll visit often for the latest information on our upcoming segments. I'll be back next week, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, for another edition of the Hallie Caster Jane Show, Talk Radio for Fine Minds, brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com forward slash the Hallie Caster Jane Show. Audible.com features over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Stay in touch, won't you? Remember, that's HallieCasterJane.com. Discover us on Facebook at Hallie Caster Jane and on Twitter at Hallie CJ. I love to hear from you. So, till we meet again, this is Hallie Caster Jane. It's a wrap.